What's going on guys and welcome back to the channel. As y'all can see, I've got on my chest jig again today, which means I'm going to make another mounting video. On this one, I've had a few requests by some folks to do a fleshing video. Uh, the deer, I don't know if y'all can see it in the frame, but I've got a deer right here that I actually did a video mounting the other day. And I'm gonna finish that deer up on camera as well. I'm gonna do an epoxy and painting video, at least that's the plan, uh, once that deer is dry and ready to finish. But today, what I'm gonna do, I've got a couple of capes that are, that are thawed and ready to flesh, and I'm going to try to kind of do a first person view like I did last time of me actually fleshing the deer. Now, before we get started, if y'all have not subscribed to the channel, uh, please do so. It doesn't cost a dime. It's just like following somebody on Facebook. Uh, you can even turn the notifications off if you want to, so you don't have to listen to every time the, your phone goes off when I've made a video. Uh, but I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers, try to get monetized. Uh, if I wasn't trying to get monetized, there wouldn't be a whole lot of reason to even make these videos. So I really appreciate the subscription if, if you're following this content. Uh, all right, next thing. I use a number 11 X-Acto knife when I'm fleshing. Uh, so this one right here, just a regular triangle shaped number 11 blade. Uh, a lot of guys are going to say that that is ridiculous and a waste of time. And it very well might be. <laughs> but as y'all will see, I do not have a fleshing machine. And that does not mean I'm not gonna get one or that you don't need one. If you've got the money and you're getting into taxes, I mean, go and buy you a fleshing machine. Uh, you can get those capes very thin, very quickly. Uh, they're just pricey. And at this point, I could go and buy one, but right here in the middle of me trying to get everything done and taken care of after this last deer season, I might end up with one either this summer or this fall uh, to give me enough time to play around with it before I start getting in my deer for next season. Uh, with a scalpel, that's what I got started with. Uh, in most of my videos, you can see me use that scalpel for almost everything. I, I use it for caping, fleshing, uh, thinning, I mean, turning the, the eyes, ears, everything. And it's cheap. So when I first opened my shop, I mean, I, I didn't want overhead because I didn't know if I was going to be successful at all. Uh, so I didn't want to spend a whole lot of money. So, I mean, the first deer I ever mounted was, was screwed to a pallet. I turned the ears with a butcher steel and I fleshed the whole thing with a scalpel. So I just kind of have done that ever since. And since I don't have a fleshing machine, the scalpel, over a period of time, I've, I've gotten fairly good with it and I can get that cape a lot thinner than I can with a scabbing knife, a scabbing knife or a regular fleshing knife. Uh, running it away from you. It takes a little bit more time uh, from start to finish. It usually takes me between an hour and an hour and a half to completely uh, flesh a, a, a green cape. Uh, but since I don't do any kind of fleshing wheel and I don't use a pressure washer, uh, which a lot of people use to flesh, uh, by the time you mess with all that equipment, get everything done with both, I mean, it, it really probably doesn't doesn't change the amount of time it took you. It's probably going to take you an hour, an hour and a half, no matter which way you look at it. Uh, which, you know, pressure wash them, you can probably get that done in 15 minutes, and you can probably uh, shave one in probably 15, 20 minutes too, if you, you know, if you were good with the equipment and familiar with it. Uh, but you're still dealing with having to clean up, get your equipment out, I mean, time it's said and done, you know, it, it's still gonna take time. Now you're gonna end up with a better product with a fleshing wheel. If you're using a fleshing wheel to actually shave hides, uh, probably I'd say 75% of the deer I do uh, are, are very thin. Uh, I live, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm in Alabama and our deer down here, the, the, the capes just don't get that thick. Even on an old buck, uh, it can get a, kind of a heavy leather to it, but I can thin it down pretty well with the scalpel. The deer I get from up north are a lot thicker and require a lot more time. And that's where a flesh wheel would really come in handy because I could shave those on down in a lot less time and just save the wear and tear off of my joints. But anyway, for now, 
that's what I've got is a scalpel. So people that are getting started, I mean, this, this will be kind of a good thing to look at because if you don't really want to go and spend one, two, three thousand dollars on a bunch of equipment, but want to try to mount a deer head, then this video might just be for you. Because like I said, I've been doing this now for five years and that's what I've used on every single deer. I did 160 deer heads last year and that number 11 blade ain't failed to be it. So let's get started. I'm gonna get my camera mounted up and we're gonna see if we can do this without cutting a bunch of holes in this cape. All right, here we are. So what we'll be using today, I've got a butcher steel, some ear turners. I've got, this is my uh, fleshing cone, <laughs> which is actually an old hammer handle. <laughs> Y'all like that? Needle nose pliers, number 11 exacto blade, knife. Got a fleshing board that I made myself out of cedar. And that is pretty much all you're gonna need. I'm not going to show y'all the ear turning. Once I get to that, I'll cut off and kind of skip that part so y'all don't have to deal with it. I've got another video y'all can watch on how to turn the ears. All right, first thing I'm going to show y'all, great way to store these capes when y'all first flesh them, or I'm sorry, when you first cape the deer. If you'll take it, see how I've got it rolled up with the head to the inside? If you'll take that cape, fold that ear down, roll it over, fold the ear down again, and roll it on up. When you go to thaw it and open it up, it's going to keep it from getting freezer burn as bad. You'll actually end up with it, it'll kind of uh, insulate itself. So that way the face, the delicate parts of the nose and ears are protected from the freezer. All right, so I'm gonna have to trim this one right here. So you got your front leg right there. I like take a knife and go right up the seam on the back of the leg, right where the white meets the brown and then kind of continue up in the brown, kind of at an angle back toward the back of that cape. You just want to stay out of that armpit. Don't want to cut that up. One side. the other. What I like to do is go ahead and turn your cape inside out and I like to flesh the neck and the body, the shoulders, before I do the head. I used to do the head first but as the hide's rubbing around on this table and getting all over everything, you end up with blood everywhere just because there's so much all over the cape. So what I like to do now is I go ahead and get it up here on my fleshing board and I'll try to go ahead and get most of that off of there before I ever do the head. That way you've got a little bit cleaner working space. All right. See if I can kind of let y'all see what I'm doing here. What I do is I'll take Take this scalpel and just keep constant pressure up here pulling against that cape and just start working that scalpel down that leather. And always use a very sharp scalpel blade, or it will be aggravating. Those, these blades are cheap. I average probably a blade per deer. 
And I mean, if you do 100, 200 deer a year, that's still not very expensive. So just get you a fresh blade when you want a fresh blade. It will make your whole day better. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all, I will probably cut several holes in this cape. And that's okay. Because you can always stitch up holes and it's gonna happen. So when you cut a hole in your cape, trying to flesh it, don't panic. If you send one of these off to the tannery, it's probably gonna come back cut up anyway. This cape is a very good friend of mine's. And he gave me permission to do a video on it because I actually told him I was gonna be moving very quickly and I might cut the hide a few times just trying to go fast. And he said that was just fine, just do what I needed to do, so. Thank you, Mike, for giving me permission on that. y'all can see when I pull with my with my left hand with my fingers it kind of rolls that rolls that cape up just enough you get a little bit of a bead where the sinew and fat is and it just cuts right into it with that scalpel blade if you just hold that scalpel down flat where it just slides right against that leather if you keep that leather tight it's actually a little bit more tough than you'd think it would be. It, it's, uh, it's easy to cut it, but it's also pretty tough. You just kind of kind of have to do it and get a feel for it. Each deer is a little bit different too. I've had deer that you almost couldn't even get the sinew off of, and then I have other deer where I cut them half to pieces. Just some of them just got really delicate skin and other ones don't.
All right. Now that's got the cape done, all except for the head. Y'all can see there's just, there's not no blood to get on anything really. Well, this cape is still kind of, kind of pink and red. That's from blood staining. Some deer won't have any on it at all. You can see right here where there was still a lot of meat and fat left, it kept the blood from getting into that cape. That's one reason why I like when people skin them and cape them after they've killed them to leave some of that fat and meat on there. It really helps protect that hide. But see these two right here, you can see these two salted capes. You see how white that is? Once you, once you get some salt on here, it will draw all that moisture and all that blood out of that hide. So anyway, I'm gonna get these ears done and we'll resume with the rest of the face. All right, you got the ears turned and the cartilage removed. So let's move on to the face. First thing I like to do is turn the lips. I do everything with my, my fingers, kind of do it by feel. But I like to take my scalpel and run it down where it's thin enough where it can be tucked once the hide gets tanned. Just run it right down along that lip line, just turn that lip right over. You can keep that lip kind of thin when you're doing this. Just be one less step you've got to do later as far as fleshing. It's hard enough to get the meat off of those thin places as it is. This way you really don't have a whole lot you're going to have to deal with. where the mouth comes together, right on the back side of the mouth, I leave very little, if any, turned skin. When you go to tuck it, it's gonna overlap, and you don't want it to be too thick right there, or it makes the mouth look a little bit funny. Just continue on around the bottom. You know, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but one thing that I've noticed when I'm editing my videos and I'm wearing my camera on my chest is that you can hear my artificial heart valve. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know if it's picking up uh, where y'all can hear it good enough to even know what it is, especially when it's really quiet like it is right now. Normally I'm playing some music in the background, but of course, with YouTube's, you know, copyright infringement, I can't have any music played in the background or they're gonna cut my video. The music y'all usually hear on my channel is actually just me playing the guitar, or making up my own stuff, because. YouTube just won't let you do it. 
which is fine. I guess the artist's got to make money too. A lot of people do a lot of the, the work on the face with the, the little scalpels. It's got the straight uh, blade. Looks more like a knife. Maybe it's just because this is what I've always used, but to me, this is the easiest. I like having the point on this to be able to get down in those little tight spots. All right, once that lip's turned, I remove the nose cartilage. If you'll cut right down, either side of the septum right there. This is the way I like to do it. Then leave yourself about a quarter inch around the inside of that nostril. Make sure my camera's still looking at what I want to look at here. If you'll cut right down between this nostril and split it, similar to the way you did the lip, You'll just turn right inside out like that. Do the same thing on the other side. Y'all, I'm gonna quit being a cheapskate one of these days. I'm gonna get me some LED bulbs and put in here so that y'all can see what I'm doing and so that I can see what I'm doing. These fluorescents are horrible. All right, once you've got the nostrils turned like that, I like to go ahead and just remove the cartilage. I don't try to do any thin fleshing right here. I just get the cartilage out of the way because it's, it's so stiff. It kind of pulls against that skin and almost keeps you from being able to flesh it with it on there. So I just go ahead and remove it and get it out of the way. Just make sure you don't cut your your nostrils open where you just turned them. That'll just come right off of there like that. All right, now, that's what you're left with. Now I take my old hammer handle. <laughs> Here, normally you'd use a flashing cone. But if you'll stick that up, in that nostril like that, take your scalpel and very carefully just work down from the top edge, fleshing that, that nostril out. I like to go around the top first, get it cut away from the edge of that skin. and start working it down toward the nose. Another one of those places you're gonna end up with some holes in your hide, more than likely. But, it can be fixed. Just remember the deer is not alive, so he's not gonna have an opinion. I like to try to get most of that uh, muscle tissue out of there, any kind of red meat that's on there. But you don't have to get it super, super thin yet. 
I like to wait until after the hide is tanned. Once you get the hide fully tanned, you can put this back in there again and it will just thin on down to nothing. But it, but it gives you a lot more pliability. It's very stretchy and elastic. And you can almost just pull it loose instead of having to try to flesh it loose. All right. Y'all can see how much that, that nostril turned in right there. Do the same thing with the other side. Now, we've got all that out of the way so that we can start to flesh. I like to start with the bottom jaw. Why, I don't know. Just I'll start on one side, make a full circle, and come all the way back around and end right there. The bottom of this jaw, the bottom jaw is, is kind of a tough place to, to mess with because it's got these two you see these two muscles that run down the bottom right here. And there's also a little bit of cartilage up under there. Uh, it's kind of thick. If you ever if you ever put your hand on that and just pinch, it's it's probably close to a quarter inch thick. And when you're fleshing this, ideally, what you want to try to do is get down to the hair follicles. You can see. See those hair follicles right there kind of popping through? That's what you want, uh, ideally, like I said, all the way down through there. Now, this is not easy to do, even if you know what you're doing. By the time you get to those follicles, you've almost cut completely through the cape. But in order to get that thick layer of skin off of that jaw, you just about have to get to those follicles. Then you just have to remember to build that back up. If y'all go back and watch my video where I mounted the deer head, you'll see where I put the clay on the bottom jaw right in front of the, or right behind the bottom lip. And that this is what I was replacing right here. I mean, y'all can see how thick that is. I mean, that's a lot of tissue You know, you have to remember that anything you remove, you have to replace when you go to mount that deer. Otherwise, it just isn't going to look quite right. And you may not even realize why. But it's usually little details like that that it's kind of like a light bulb turns on when you finally realize what happened. You see it the right way and know what you did. It just makes everything look so much better. I don't know if any of y'all know Shane Smith. He's got uh, artistic compositions up in uh, Bridgeport, Alabama. Big uh, waterfowl and turkey taxidermist. 
he can mount, Shane can mount anything. But he specializes in birds and his, his birds are absolutely incredible. Matter of fact, my first turkey I killed about 20 years ago, uh, Shane mounted it for me. And I just was blown away at the quality of his work even back then and now he's just even gotten better. But anyway, one thing that Shane Smith said a long time ago was one of the most important things that you can do as a taxidermist is to learn the anatomy of your animal. Uh, now that's not a direct quote exactly, but I've watched Shane do a lot of things. I've watched a lot of his videos and stuff, and Shane knows a turkey as well as any wildlife biologist or anybody. He, he knows the muscles' names, the bones' names. He knows every feather, how many feathers are on that bird in every spot. I mean, he, he just knows that turkey's anatomy so that when he goes to mount one, he knows what's wrong with it. He knows what has to be rebuilt. I mean, he can make one from scratch, you know, and never even need a form or, or, a, or anything. He just, he just knows a turkey. And if you'll do the same thing with a deer, when, when, when I heard him say that and watch the way that he, he described turkeys in his, in his videos, I mean, he'll sit there and talk about them using those, those scientific names and it's gotten so just commonplace for him that once you learn that animal, then when you mount it up and you look at it and realize something's not quite right, you, you begin to recognize what isn't right and can fix it. And that's one thing that I think really made Shane stand apart from a lot of other guys is that being able to recognize what the bird was supposed to look like and what it was missing is just, you know, it's, it's kind of the easy part of being a taxidermist. You know, it, it's, it's not hard to learn how to do this. There's a lot of information on just how to do it. Uh, you know, but, but actually getting hands on and learning how to do all of this stuff, you know, takes a little bit of time and experience and, and definitely some, you know, hit and miss, you know, problems you might have. But if you'll, if you'll study the anatomy, and I don't just mean reference pictures, I mean like actual pictures. I mean, you get on Google and just Google, you know, a deer's muscle structure and bone structure. And when you sit there and look at those, those pictures, like, like look up a deer's ear muscles. Just Google deer's ear muscles and hit images. You know, and look at the way that those muscles interact with the ear to cause that ear to turn and twist the way that it does. You know, a deer's ear kind of twists when he goes to listen behind him. His, his ear doesn't turn. It's kind of got a little bit of a twisting motion. It's, it's kind of interesting the more that you research stuff like that, it, it just all of a sudden gives you that, that blueprint of how to build that on your mount. Some guys are better at it than others just from artistic ability, but, but man, that kind of information right there will just get you so much further ahead, so much faster. Because it's, I mean, it's something that I just never did think about. There's another place, y'all, when y'all get to this nose pad, y'all can see, you start seeing those hair follicles again. Make sure I don't see that in the camera. And that gets very, very thin. It's, it's another place that it's, it's really easy to cut holes right here in the front of this nose pad. The good thing about this area, though, is that when you go to mount the nose, you're gonna build it back up with clay to replace all of this meat and muscle tissue that I'm removing right here. And then also any holes that you've put in it, you can fill in with a little bit of epoxy. And then you're gonna add nose texture on top of that 
and then paint on top of that, and then sealer on top of that. <laughs> so, you know, a hole in the nose basically is 100% unnoticeable, especially if it's in the actual nose pad. But just take your time. Like, I use my fingers up under that nose to just, I just go by feel, basically. You can just, as it starts to get thin, you can just feel it kind of work itself out. And that's something that you, you know, you're just going to have to do and, and just get a feel for. <laughs> Some folks use small fleshing boards and stuff to do this, but I tried that a long time ago and I had more of a tendency to cut a bunch of holes in it because I was getting it too thin without realizing it, whereas with my fingers I can actually feel where I'm at through that through that nose. And yes, I have cut myself a few times doing this. But I do have a first aid kit down here in my shop. So Cap was beginning to get just dull enough when it was getting aggravating. Y'all know what? I'm gonna go ahead and change this blade. I just can't keep it sharp enough now to make it do what I need it to do. All right. 
Now I'll probably cut it all to pieces. Because this one is sharp. You can see I'm getting back down to that bottom jaw. That muscle comes back around all the way to that front lip. Remember what I said on the other side. Just try to get this all the way down to those hair follicles right here, especially because you want that detail on that bottom lip. You sure don't want to leave a lot of this meat down there. You'll end up having your hide try to rot on you. Just like that. All right. Next step. Put my head back up on my flesh and beam. And can, hopefully y'all can see that. It's a little bit far away from me. Right at the top of the nose where you ended on top of that nose pad, you just want to continue right there. Flesh that on down the top of the, the nose. All the way up the snout back toward the eyes.
All right, when you get to the eye, this is what I like to do. Make sure my camera's where y'all can see it here. I like to take all of my eyelid, all the skin that I'm going to use to trim and tuck, and I make just a little cut all the way around that eye just to separate that from the rest of the, the sinew. That way as you're fletch, fleshing, it's kind of like we did with the nostrils, that will pull away from there and keep you from cutting all that eye that you need to save. Come on down here to the tear ducts. When you get to the tear duct, there's gonna be a hole Cut that tear duct out of there. All right, guys, sorry about that. I ran out of SD card, so hopefully that file is still good. All right, I was at the tear ducts here. When you trim around these tear ducts, where that tear duct comes through, that skin is right there. And if you can prevent it, Try to keep from cutting all the way through it and making a hole. A lot of times you will, you can actually see the little dark spot right there is where that, that hole goes through the, the, the skin. And it's fine, you can tuck it and it's, you know, most of them you will end up with a hole right there. But in this case, we actually did it without cutting all the way through, which is fantastic. The skin around these eyes, not the skin, but the actual meat itself, the, the flesh is really thick in places. So you want to make sure that you get all of that out of there. You'll actually see the hair follicles around the eye too, where the, where the eyelashes and stuff are at, or the eyebrows, however. However you say that. Alrighty. The top right here. I don't know if y'all can hear that gristle, but can y'all hear hear that scalpel scratching into that? It's very similar to a boar hog where those hogs have got those, those plates around their neck to perfect, protect them when they're fighting. A buck has got that cartilage all around his head where his, where his antlers come in and you wanna get that down too where, it's, where you're down to the soft leather. Try to cut most of that thick layer out of there. You'll see how much, see how much meat there is under that eye. All that's got to go. This, in my opinion, is the most important place on the entire deer mount. The eyes, to me, are what makes a deer. Uh, a, a really pretty mount just looks like the deer is looking at you or looking off in the distance. And you can, you can mess up the ears to a point and a lot of other pieces of that, that mount, but, but when the eyes look right, man, it just makes it look so good. And having this real thin, getting rid of all this extra tissue is gonna make that happen. When you're thinning too, especially if you don't have a fleshing machine, if you'll thin this right up to the edge of the hair right there, thin the edge of that to where you've got real thin 
Okay, for one thing, it'll help it stitch, be easier to stitch up, but it'll also, it won't shrink as bad, it won't pull away uh, from your stitches. It won't open up near as bad, like if you just left it thick. That's something else I like to do once the cape is, is tan, you can go back along those edges with your scalpel and just get it just paper thin. All right, and then all you're left with is that eye skin and we're gonna leave that on there. That'll all get trimmed before you go to mount it up. We're gonna do the same thing on the other side. See that little hole right there? That's that tear duct. See that? Right there. Well, that point really comes in handy on that scalpel blade. Right up in those little spots like that. this round get up under the bottom of this be kind of careful down through here because this skin is very thin 
get to working too fast, instead of cutting a little nick in it, you'll end up with a hole three inches long. That's not what you want. That's got all of the meat and fat removed. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this right back over my flesh and beam. I'm gonna get up here around these ears and thin down these edges right here. See that? Just going right down the edge of that line and thinning the edge of that cape so I can stitch it easier. ear over the top of your flesh and beam and you got something to pull against now that the ear is fleshed out I like to put it back over here and up under the bottom of this ear between the the ear butt and the bottom of your seam where you cut it down the back of the head I like to thin this on out just a little bit more anywhere that it feels like it's a little bit thick. Because I can 100% promise you, if you're gonna have hair slip on a hide, this will be one of the first places that it does it. Come on down through here and thin that edge. Bottom side's already thinned out pretty good. Alrighty. We're gonna get this other side.
Thin this out just a little bit right under this ear. There again, all of this can be done with a fleshing wheel. Now then, I'm going to get this other one. I've got another cake that I've got to flash out. When I get it done, we're going to move on to the salt. All right, guys, I am finished. Got the other cape ready to go. This is the first cape that we did on camera. Let's put some salt on it. What I use, this right here, I get at Lowe's, made by Clorox, and it's actually fast dissolving. Uh, this salt right here is super, super fine. Very fine granulated salt. And it, uh, it absorbs into the cake really quick. Also sticks really good too, it doesn't fall off like the some of the bigger granules do. What you want to do is just absolutely cover this thing and rub that salt into the cake. Don't be shy with the salt either. Salt is cheap. At least it's cheap right now. Let it be expensive like everything else for too long, but. I don't remember which famous taxidermist said it. He's one of the big name guys, makes some of the forms. I don't think it was Ben Mears. I can't remember, but anyway, somebody had asked him, how much salt you use when you're salting a cake. And his response was, just don't put salt anywhere you want the hair to fall out. <laughs> so needless to say, you need to cover this thing in salt just like you're using dry preservative and we're gonna mount it. Just gotta draw all of those liquids out of that hide. camera still cameraing. <laughs> All right. One thing to remember when you do this too is don't ever reuse salt. Even the salt that spills on the table or that comes off of this, it's got a little bit of blood, a little bit of color to it. I don't even like to use it. You got some good clean white salt. It'll start pulling these liquids out of this cape in, in minutes. It doesn't take long at all. Once you get this cape hung up, it'll start dripping fluid nearly immediately.
All right, that looks pretty good. So now what I do is, this whole thing got good and covered and rubbed in. I can find my frames. I use a cape frame. Run that right up on there. I like to pull it down, stretch it just as far as you can get it to stretch while it's still damp. Once that salt starts to dry, it'll try to draw that thing up and it'll keep that from happening. And when I do, I have got hooks up there on my ceiling. And I just hook it right through the nostril and around that cape frame and hang it from the ceiling. And I'll show y'all here in just a second. By the time we get this cape right here salted, that other cape will probably be seeping fluid. Just one more time. Y'all can see, I just got just a couple hooks screwed into my rafters there. My capes can hang. You can see the floor right here where that blood is already starting to drip. See on the bottom of this hide how much moisture is collecting. I mean, it just really is crazy just how fast that that starts to, to seep. What I like to do is I'll let those capes sit overnight 
Uh, tomorrow I'll come down here and just kind of brush them with my hand and just get any loose salt off and then I'll re-salt them and let them sit for another night. That's uh, that's one way to do it. I've got, man, I've probably got five different friends that are taxidermists that all do this a different way. Uh, there's guys that don't use salt at all in this step. They go straight into a pickling solution, which is what I've got these hides in right here, uh, which is actually water, salt, and a pickling acid. And I know guys that go straight from fleshing into that pickle. And they said they have great results and they do amazing work. Uh, one of these days I may try that. Now I know the people that do that use a pressure washer to flesh, which is going to actually press a lot of those fluids and blood and, and whatever out of that cape so you don't have the tendency uh, for bacteria to grow and for your hair to slip, start falling out. I've also heard that you're not supposed to use a salt frame. Um, I've heard guys say to, to salt them, roll them up, leave them on a slanted incline so that they can drain that way. Uh, that way the hide don't actually get hard. From my experience, I've had more capes that tried to slip the hair when I did it that way. I don't know what the difference was, I don't know why, but even doing them one day on a salt frame didn't have as good results for me as two days. Uh, that salting process, that second day when it really locks down that hair and there's no more fluids draining out of that hide, you do have to rehydrate them uh, before you can pickle them. It's not good to put them straight into the pickle if they get almost hard like they're cured. Uh, you can't really do that. They won't pickle correctly. But if you rehydrate them, then pickle them. Uh, I just don't have any problem with the hair slipping. It was since I started doing it that way, uh, I haven't had any issue at all. So I guess we're going to call that done. Our deer that we mounted the other day is starting to dry up pretty good. It's got, let's see. Yeah, it's won't be too much longer. It'll be ready for some epoxy and some paint. So anyway, maybe in the next, probably be maybe the next week, uh, maybe we'll get down here and finish that deer up. I'll show y'all how I do my epoxy and paint work. But until then, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and we'll see y'all next time.